we're successively going through the, the barrage of questions that came a few weeks ago, and, and we've done all kinds of different things. And look at this one. Inquisitions, witch hunts, and I added God's word. And basically, uh, the question was something about is there a connection between the Spanish Inquisition that started in the 15th century, 14-something, and didn't officially end until the 19th century, 18-something. It was like 1834. And then they worked in, the questioner worked in the Salem witch trials and said, how is all that connected, you know, the, the, uh, in Massachusetts, uh, all that. And so I reduced that question down to a topic, and the topic is, uh, where did we get this Inquisition stuff in the name of Christ? That's the only reason I'm covering this. The Inquisition was done in the name of Jesus Christ. How on earth could you stretch and pierce and dissect in a torturous way humans in the name of Christ? They did a lot of other stuff, you know. They were the original, you know how the Nazis put yellow uh, tags on all the Jews? I, I don't know if you followed history, but do you remember when they would put them in the ghettos, they had to put a yellow tag so you knew who the Jews were? The, the Roman Catholic Church started that early. They tagged the Jews and the Muslims. Did you know that? They made them wear a tag to mark them. So how does that, how does that work? And, and what about witch hunts? How about killing witches? How, that also was done in America, uh, uh, was done in the name of Christ. How? How do Christians burn heretics like Calvin did, Servetus? How do Christians make people wear badges and ostracize them because they're either Jews or Muslims? How do they sneak around and listen and capture witches and kill them? And how, how could that possibly be attached to God's word? And so here's the real, real topic how do we have such misuse of the Bible over the centuries? That, that even, I mean, uh, I know this is funny, but walking in, I was coming in the aisle, and you know what someone said to me? Dear friend of mine, they said, I wish my parents would have, or that I would have heard your message this morning 60 years ago. It would have changed a lot of the activities in my life. And what they were saying is probably they didn't do anything on Sunday because uh, it was the Sabbath day. Well, there's nothing wrong with being observant of the Lord's day. There's a lot wrong with killing people. And you would think nowadays, the way some Christians talk about homosexuals, that they would be willing almost to kill them. They're so bad. And now all the other variants of that. So before I get off topic, let's just stay here. This brings up the point of the value of church history. And by the way, that's, that's what my uh, studies, that's actually what I went to school to be, uh, uh, to get my doctorate in church history. In fact, I taught church history at the Master's Seminary, and I still teach it when I travel in a lot of places. There is great value in church history. Let me just give you, uh, for those of you that like to study, I popped up some of my favorite books because I encourage people to not just um, uh, be eating what someone tells you, but to actually go make your own meals and find it. This is the classic right here. You can't see it, but this is off of Amazon. This is Philip Schaff. This is probably the granddaddy of all church historians. I mean, Eusebius was the first, Eusebius of Caesarea, but Philip Schaff of the 19th century uh, was the classic. And you notice he has an eight-volume set here that is called The History of the Christian Church, and that is kind of like the backbone. Uh, it's not all written in English, and I wouldn't suggest you buy it, but it is phenomenal. It is electronic nowadays. And, and he was probably the most profuse church historian of modern times. This is a different take. Uh, this is called Christianity Through the Ages, and his name is Kenneth Scott Latourette. This is the liberal view. Uh, now, the liberal view means that he would not be an evangelical Christian. He might not even, I don't know, he probably calls himself a Christian. I don't even know if he is a Christian. 
but he represents kind of the, the United Church, whatever, United Pres or United Meth or United, you know, whatever, uh, church view of Christianity through the ages. And it's, it's also, these two are very academic. This guy, his name is Earl with an E, E, Earl E. Cairns, um, was a decade after decade church history professor at Wheaton, you know, Wheaton College in Chicago, in Wheaton, um, is it in Wheaton, Illinois? I guess, I don't, I, but I've been there and it's wonderful and you know, the Billy Graham Center and all that. But uh, his book is called Christianity Through the Centuries. This actually is the textbook when I used to teach at the master's college. Uh, we use this, the seminary of course used uh, upper level, but when I taught at the master's college in Los Angeles, this was the text and it is phenomenal. In fact, I would say for anybody that has, if, if you've already got your, your study Bible, you know, like your MacArthur study Bible and maybe a good systematic theology, the next important piece is that church history piece. Uh, and it's very valuable. So that's one of my favorites, Christianity Through the Centuries. I've taught through that book several times. Uh, basically, uh, Schaff, Cairns, all of them follow the same basic within a few years division. So to answer this question, we'll do a quick overview of church history. There's a re really three um, main pieces that make up church history. There's the first, you know, from uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ through the first true pope. Now there are popes for centuries, but this one, his name was uh, Gregory, and Gregory the Great, uh, he was a, I mean, he was a modern pope as we know popes, powerful, influential uh, man. So ancient church history goes from the cross, the gospels, the book of Acts, the epistles to the first pope, and that's called ancient church history. Then we have this whole center area that is really confusing to a lot of people, and this is what we're still hearing about. You heard a little bit from uh, Chad, he says that people in France might think of the church, and they might think of the Crusades, he said. Uh, this is the period of the monastic, you know, the rise of the monastic movement. This is the period of the Crusades. Uh, this medieval part, and this is also the time when the Inquisition, and that's why we're even doing this, because that's the original question, but the Inquisition that was many-pronged was started in Rome in this period. Uh, the Inquisitor General, in the name of Jesus Christ, would put you on the rack until you did something. Uh, and it ends, medieval church history starts with this first pope, it ends with the Halloween, you know, uh, October 31st, nailing to the Wittenberg Church the 95 questions that the teaching monk of Wittenberg, the genius Martin Luther, had written down his questions. He was a debater and he liked to talk over things and reason with people scholastically. And the 95 theses were not, you know, anything less than just saying, let's talk about this. And, and he wanted to understand why the practices of the Roman church didn't match up with the scriptures. And he found 95 areas that he wanted to talk over. And that really launched us into what we would call modern day church history, uh, the, the 95 Theses of Luther. So those are the three divisions. Within the divisions, there, there are very fascinating, and if you read Schaff, eight volumes, or Karen's one volume, you'll find out this age, this is one of the, the fascinating parts of what happened to all the disciples, the, the apostles as they went out, and everything that was going on with the church, and how the church spread, and, and that. This is probably one of the more, even more fascinating, is the time of the martyrs. After John, the last apostle, uh, died, what happened to the church? And actually, you notice these numbers don't exactly line up. It was during the reign of the infamous Nero, the homosexual emperor in public. It, it's so much like, the, the time of Nero is so much like the time we're living through right now. It's a time where there was flagrant immorality, just blatant immorality. And with that immorality came 
the initial persecutions of the church, and you've heard about all this with Nero uh, martyring and, and uh, he used to, in fact, if you've ever seen a picture of Rome, you've seen the Colosseum. The Colosseum is actually parked over the lake that was in front of Nero's golden palace. They, actually, they drained the lake and filled it in, and uh, later uh, Domitian built the, the Colosseum there. And so uh, that, that, or started to build it, and then his brother finished it, Vespasian and, and, and all. But uh, here is this Colosseum over this gigantic drained lake that Nero used to have house parties in Rome. How did he light his, his house parties? He had torches that were like telephone poles. And what the torches were made of is living Christians dipped in tar, tied, and burned alive. I mean, how would you like to go to a cookout where you could smell humans being burnt to death? And that's the conditions that were going on, and it just got worse until the end of the persecution times by the Romans, not the end of persecution, but the Romans stopped with Constantine in AD 313, and, you know, we could talk about that all night. And that starts the period of time known as Christian rulers. This is when the Roman emperors were vacillating between being Christian in name for expediency of their political goals. Uh, and there's, I mean, like Constantine's mother, Helena, built a cathedral on every Christian site she could find. And if you go to the Holy Land, there are cathedrals over all of the big sites. That was when her, her son, the emperor, became a Christian so that he could conquer the empire. And you know the story of that, and I won't go into that tonight. His famous, um, Constantine's famous saying was, in hoc signe vince, that's Latin for in this sign conquer. And what he did is before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, uh, on every Roman shield, he had them paint a cross because in his vision he saw a cross and heard a voice and he won. And so he said, I'll make the empire Christian. But what did he do? He caused a lot of problems. He took all of the pagan pantheon, you know what the pantheon is, that big building that Hadrian made, uh, and pan means all and theon means gods, and he took the pantheon of all the pagan religions and all the priests and all of their outfits and all of their beads and all of their candles and all of their traditions and all of their holidays, and he merged it with this. So he took the, the holy Catholic, as in the universal church that Jesus started, and merged it with the Roman pantheon. And the, the combined effort became the Roman Catholic church. And so it was a mixture of paganism, all of this, I mean, where did Lent come from? It's not in the Bible. It's of holiday from Egypt. Uh, where did, uh, um, I mean, we could go through all of this. Where did the beads and the vestments and the tiaras and all that stuff that you see in Romanism today come from? It's not any of it in the Bible. It comes from over here. He made every pagan priest a part of the Catholic Church right from the get-go in 313. And that's where we got this amalgam that we have now. So, and then it went on for hundreds of years. So that's, that's ancient. So then it goes into the medieval church. Big pope, uh, really, really powerful. And the missionary era, this is where all the monks go. I mean, I mean, they went out as priests, out as missionaries. I mean, missions is not new. It's ancient. It, it was from 590 A.D. Well, far before, you know, true Christians, but a real mixture here. And, for, for example, they went in the 900s to Poland. I forget which, which monk went there. And they baptized the entire country. They did it in about a few months' time. They rode horses with holy water and with these big paintbrushes, and they just would do crowds at a time like this. They would take a paintbrush, put it in the holy water, and go, and as the water fell on the people, they said, you are saved, you are saved, you are saved. And Poland became an entirely Roman Catholic country in about a year. 
through the missionary work. And there are all kinds of missionaries that went over. You know, Saint, you've heard of St. Patrick, and you've heard of all these, Columba, and all these people that went all over the world spreading the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the, the interesting thing is, during this time, on, before the Council of Trent, you weren't sure what Roman Catholic meant. And so if you had a godly person like Bernard of Clairvaux, who wrote the great hymn, Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast, but sweeter far thy face to see in thy presence rest. The, he was a monk, uh, Cistercian Bernard of Clairvaux, and, and he lived in this time period, and he was probably a, a godly believer. And then there were a lot of people that weren't, and they were just in it for something else. But that's, this is the, the monk and missionary era. Then what rose from that was the papal era, and this is the reason all these dates are here. Uh, Henry IV walked through the snow to the gates of uh, Gregory VII. So Henry IV is the king of France, France, and uh, Gregory VII is a pope. And he said, no one in France can have communion if your king doesn't bow to the pope. And so Henry IV walked barefooted through the snow to the Pope's villa and got on his knees, the king of France, in front of the Pope. That marked the, the absolute papal power rise. It peaks uh, with a guy named Innocent III. You can look all these people up. Innocent III was kind of like Genghis Khan. He was less Pope and more warrior than anybody. And then it craters in 1294 with a guy named Boniface VIII. These are all popes, by the way. And Boniface VIII blew it and, and overstepped the bounds of popes. And what he said is, if you don't bow to me, you can't be saved. And he just, he made it so um, like he was a god that people rebelled. And that's where we get into this time, the pre-Reformation, where people are saying, the Pope is not infallible. He is, and there's a lot of bad stuff in here uh, and in here uh, that all of you know about. I mean, Alexander VI had about 60 children. 6 0. Oh, he's, he's celibate and unmarried man that has 60 children of his own, and he makes them all cardinals. I mean, it's just, it's the incredibly uh, dissolute time. And, and that's what prompts Luther's questions. But in this time period, we have people like, if you ever heard of, uh, you know, Wycliffe, Huss, remember Johannes Huss from Prague? Uh, these people, these pre-reformers, are, they're believers, and they're saying, this isn't right, this isn't good. So that's, what, that's kind of the end. The, the, uh, Luther marks the end of the medieval time when people didn't question anything. And uh, then we go into, sorry, modern. I didn't change that. Modern church history, and that starts with uh, Martin Luther and goes to the present. And it's the area, the time of the Reformation, and what Luther didn't realize is Luther unleashed not only the gospel, but he unleashed people starting to realize that, that uh, they could have na national, not under the jurisdiction of the pope, and, they, and it, it launched kind of a political movement that ended you know, there was the Thirty Years' War and the Hundred Years' War and everything else, but the Thirty Years' War ended in 1648 with the peace, what's known in history as the Peace of Westphalia, and that's where all the countries were fighting over whether they are going to be Catholic or whether they are going to be Lutheran, Protestant, Lutheran, and all that stuff. John Knox, you've heard of him, that was uh, in the British Isles, and, and uh, the Lutheran Church took over a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, the Scandinavian countries and a lot of uh, uh, Germany and, and the Protestant church was over there and the, in Holland, you know, and all that's where we got it, imported over here to, you know, western Michigan. And, and, but this transition area, era is when the church waned. The Roman church waned because of the rise of Protestantism. And this, this is piece of Westphalia when the church is kind of waning and it becomes more European-centered. And this is when William Carey took off. And it's the, William Carey is looked on in church history as the dawn of modern church history. The, the taking of Protestant gospel preaching, not making people Roman Catholics by, you know, putting water on them, 
but actually going out and chatting and Kimberleying nations. And, and of course, you know, William Carey did that, translating the Bible and all that in India. And that's the advent of modern missions. So that's just, I mean, if you went to church history, you just got the, you know, the first overview. So why do we study church history? And how can we understand inquisitions and witch hunts and all that? Well, number one, church history can correct our misconceptions. And let me just give you one misconception, that the Roman Catholic Church has been the same all the way through. And here's just a typical chart. Now, too many words for a slide, but it's just a chart that people in church history have. And what it is is it's the split between Roman Catholicism and Christ. Remember I told you that Constantine added the paganism to the Holy Catholic Church. In fact, I have fun when I ride airplanes and sit next to someone and I'm reading my Bible. They're kind of cautious and they look at me and they say, what do you do? I say, oh, I teach ancient literature. <laughs> and they go, really? What, what kind of ancient literature? I said, oh, I teach ancient Hebrew and Greek literature, the primary documents of the Christian faith. And they go, what does that mean? I said, I teach the Bible. And they go, most of them say, I'm Catholic. Or they'll say, I'm Roman Catholic. And I say, oh, I'm Catholic. I'm not Roman Catholic. And they go, boy, they're really puzzled by that. You know, primary documents, Christian faith, Catholic, not Roman. And so I say, I'm a Bible teacher. And they say, well, I have a question. You see, we have to, and I appreciate the, the presentation tonight, we have, to, we have to make Christ available where people can understand what we're what we're trying to communicate with them. So let me just talk about what happened from Christ's time to the 21st century. Here we are in the 21st century. What has happened? Well, the Bible has not changed. That's the straight line. The gospel of Jesus Christ communicated through the word of God and within the body of the Christ, the true believers throughout all centuries, has not changed. For, for many centuries... It was, it was pretty much uh, clear until the Roman Catholic Church began this journey totally away from the Scriptures. Now, all these little words you can't see are just points of church history. Let me just read a few of them. The invention of purgatory, right here, in the 6th century, the 6th, Christ lived and was crucified and was buried and rose in the first century. Five hundred and many years later, in the sixth century, purgatory was invented with the advent of the first real pope, Gregory the first. And they couldn't find purgatory in the Bible because it's not there. So they went to Second Maccabees, that's an apocryphal book. And in Second Maccabees, 24 chapters, they found an obscure Jewish tradition of making offerings for the dead. Now, does the Bible talk about that? No. But some Jewish people in the Maccabean Wars said, oh, we should make an offering. They died in the war. We're not sure they were right with God. We'll make an offering. And they clung to that and invented a place of purging, purgatory. And it just started growing. They went from just purgatory to limbo. You probably have heard of limbo. And there's two of them. There's limbus patrum and limbus infantum. Is any of that in the Bible? No. You see, it's going away from the Bible. It's, it's traditions. It's... it's it's man's teaching. And so they made a system where people that have never heard the gospel could go to some place and you, and by the, by the way, it didn't take them very long to start making money on it, that you could give money to the Roman Catholic Church to burn candles and have a mass for your great, great, great grandfather that is still in this burning place, and you could get him out. Now, who wouldn't want to do that? For your poor relative? I mean, don't you hear where this is going? By the way, that's still going on. I mean, it, bizarre as it is, unbiblical as it is, 
What I just read to you, or just said to you, is what is going on in Catholic churches. I mean, you go to the Vatican, they have so many chapels, they have continuous masses going on. And you can purchase a mass to be done for some departed, and you buy it, and the candles, and you can, and unbelievable. So, but that all started in the sixth century, and that's when the church started going away. Then the Pope wanted not just to have this purgatory card, but he started wanting in the 8th century to have temporal power. They weren't content with just running the church. They wanted to start running life. Now, now we're getting to where the inquisitions and the witch hunts come from. They began looking at the Old Testament and seeing, whoa, in the Old Testament, I mean, they're, they are executing people for this and that, and they're doing this and that in a theocracy, theokratos, when God is in control. The theocracy is God is running the country through his appointed kings, and he said certain sins had capital punishment. They wanted that. And so how do they get it? Well, in the ninth century, there's a fabrication called the Donation of Constantine, where Constantine in 313, they found a manuscript 500 years later that said he granted the power of the empire to the pope. That was a convenient find. The ink wasn't even dry on it, you know, if you read about it in, her, in history. And so what happens is uh, they began having temporal powers for the pope, and the popes become warriors. Have you ever seen pictures of them? They used to wear armor and ride horses and joust. The popes, they conquered they were riding all over the Italian peninsula, the Papal States. They conquered. They fought. Uh, Innocent III, they said, was, was one of the greatest warriors of all time. And he just was expanding the borders of Rome. And so what they started doing is getting more power. They decided, Gregory VII, the greatest mass divorce in history. He said all Roman Catholic priests must divorce their wives and be celibate, single, unmarried in 1075. Priests were married until 1075. How do you think we got the, the Orthodox Church? You know, the Greek Orthodox and, and the Russian Orthodox, you know, all those Orthodox churches, they're all over, they have those nice festivals with Greek food or whatever. Where did they come from? Right here. They said, we're not going to divorce our wives, and they broke, it's called the Great Schism, or Schism, or Schism. Uh, you know, they split. The, the, the Orthodox Church split from the Roman Catholic Church. Did you know what they're talking about now? Merging back. The Lutherans are talking about coming back too. And what's happened is that all of these uh, denominations have gotten so far from the Bible, they don't mind joining with the Roman Catholic Church because none of them are tied very much to the Bible anymore. But that's Gregory VII. Then they started charging money uh, in the 12th century for masses. And that's, right after that, is when the Inquisition starts in the 12th century, 1184 to be exact. And Rome started an Inquisition to make sure people were really, really Christians. And if they had any doubt about them, they put them through the Inquisition. And it started out being a trial, but it got worse and worse. And you know how bad people are. Uh, people actually enjoy torture. I mean, look at what we've gone through with even... America and Iraq and some of the atrocities. There's always been atrocities, and it's not anything new. But the Catholic Church started being in atrocity mode with the Inquisition. It spread out and went by the time the Spanish Inquisition doesn't start till way down here. But the Roman uh, Inquisition out of the Vatican started way up here, 12th century, 16th or 15th century. They start selling indulgences. What are indulgences? Indulgences that you can buy while you're alive, time out of purgatory. It's kind of like the ultimate IRA, you know, a heaven IRA or something. And they started, they started what they said is, and, and I mean, it's amazing. They said that a saint, a saint has so much righteousness, they have more than they need to get to heaven. And all the saints' extra righteousnesses, it's called the supererogation of the saints, is the theological term, goes into this big pot in heaven. Uh, all this, this supererogation of the saints. And uh, erogation is, ergo is work. So it's, they had more works than they needed to get to heaven which is a real problem. You can't get to heaven by works to start with. So the whole thing is flawed. But the super arrogation of the saints went into this pot, and this pot was for sale. And that's what indulgences are. Uh, Mary had so many 
credits in her account that she didn't even die. She, she, right here, the assumption of the Virgin Mary, she bodily was assumed to heaven. She only went into a sleep. She was so right. I mean, I, I'm sorry, it has to be. I've taught this so many times, it's almost funny, but it isn't funny. People really believe it. But to think of a system where all these people, Mary and Paul and all these saints that there are, they have more than they need to get to heaven, so it goes into a pot, and we're going to sell the pot to whoever will pay for it. The apostles did not sell salvation. Silver and gold have I not. What I have I give you in the name of Jesus, is what Peter said. And they got so far from that, and so they started selling indulgences. And you know how Luther got all bothered by that. And then transubstantiation. The mass as we know it today didn't start until the 13th century. What is transubstantiation? It's saying that by invoking some Latin words, uh, in fact, this is where in children's stories. You ever heard of hocus pocus? You know, that's a word for magic, hocus pocus. That's a denigration of a Latin term. What the Roman Catholic Church said, they taught the priest to elevate the host, the, the bread, the body of Christ, and they would go, hocus corpus meum, hocus corpus meum. And by saying those words, normal bread was transmuted into the body, the literal body of Jesus Christ. And that process is based on the doctrine of transubstantiation. And transubstantiation says that the, the body of Christ, through the, through the bread being intoned with hoc es corpus meum. Well, by the way, most of the people didn't speak Latin. The only thing they caught up they could catch from the priest doing that is hocus pocus. And they started trying to do a little hocus pocus themselves, and that's where a lot of the magic of the Middle Ages came from. But they start this dogma of transubstantiation, which, by the way, Luther, Luther never fully detached from the Roman Catholic Church. That's part of the problem we have today. He kept the anti-Semitism, the hatred of the Jews. He, he didn't move away from transubstantiation, Completely, he moved one step away, consubstantiation. What he believes is, the, the transubstantiation is that the bread becomes Christ's body. Consubstantiation, this is the Lutheran doctrine, is that the presence of Christ surrounds the bread. Isn't that interesting? We believe in neither. We believe it's a picture of Christ. That's what he said. He said, this is my body. We did it this morning. We had communion. Uh, we had crackers. Mine was right up here. There is no way anybody in this service should think that was Christ's body. It was a picture of his body. Luther said that the, the presence of Christ surrounds it. The, the doctrine of the Roman church is it becomes it, and this becomes Jesus Christ's body. And that started not until the 13th century. There was no mass, as you know it today, till the 13th century of this whole uh, the, the, uh, conversion of the normal bread into the body of Christ. Then they start the adoration of the host. After they said it turned into his body, they began to worship the host, the, the, this bread. And then, because people were starting to question, Within three years, they made the Bible on the index of the Council of Toledo that it was a capital offense to have a copy of the Bible. You, they burned people in the 1300s that had a copy of the Bible. Isn't that amazing? They used to chain the Bible. The Catholic Church had a giant Bible in the cathedral, and it was chained to the altar. No one was allowed to take that thing out. And the people weren't allowed to read it, and it was in Latin anyway, and they couldn't read it. And so... Then in the 14th century, 1303, that's when the Pope overstepped and he made the, the bull called Unam Sanctum, which uh, is Latin for uh, that there's only one holy Catholic church and if you're not a part of it, you're out and you're going to hell. Then uh, by the 15th century, the cup was denied to laymen uh, that, that they couldn't touch it. That's where the whole, if you know anything about Catholicism, you come forward, the priest holds the cup, he dips the... the uh, consecrated bread in and puts it on your tongue. And the reason they do that is if even a crumb of it falls to the ground, that's the body of Christ. And so the whole wafer has to be dipped and put right into your mouth. You can't touch it and you can't let it fall because it's, it's been changed into the body of Christ. Um, 
Then all of this got finalized up until right here, the Roman Catholic Church was a mixed bag of believers, unbelievers, but they were all in one big church because no one knew what anybody else fully believed until six, the 16th century, 1545. It's called the Council of Trent. And that's when the Roman Catholic Church wrote down this whole system with all the sacraments, mass, uh, purgatory, and they codified it. And what they said is, if you don't believe this, you cannot be saved. And they added all of that human religion and everything to the Bible. And like the Immaculate Conception of Mary, you ever heard of the Immaculate Conception? What is the Immaculate Conception? It means when Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother, Anne, her mother, not Mary, Mary's mother had a sinless child. Mary was sinless in her mother's womb. Where does it say that? Nowhere. See, they're getting so far away from Scripture that, but do you know when that started? Just before the Civil War. The Immaculate Conception of Mary, that, that doctrine wasn't until 1854. Then, I mean, I could go through all these. In 1950, the church declared that Mary's body was assumed to heaven, that she just slept. In fact, there's a church, um, that it's called the Dormition Abbey in Jerusalem, and it's the church of the Dormition. It's the place where Mary slept. She didn't die. She went to sleep. And she stayed there for 1,900 years. And then they actually declared, the Pope in 1950, I forget his name, declared that sitting on the chair in the Lateran. And whenever you sit in the chair, ex cathedra, if you've ever heard the term, whatever he says sitting in that chair in the Lateran is ex cathedra. It's from God. It's equal with the Bible. And he sat in that chair, the same place that the Pope sat in this chair, and said, Mary was uh, in her mother's womb sinless. So look at that. So see how far, and you know, the, the line keeps going. The Catholic Church has been having meetings with the Buddhists. They're having meetings with, did you know that the Muslims and the Catholics agree on Mary? They both revere her. It's amazing how Rome is just meeting with everybody and trying to find common ground. As long as, as this is used, we have no common ground. The Bible is divisive. Doctrine divides. But if you start sliding with whatever uh, works, you can get so far away, and that's where the Roman Catholic Church, did you know it's still the same? Did you know there are many Catholics they're not really Roman Catholics. They kind of study the Bible and they believe in Christ, but they go there. They shouldn't, but they do. And you know what I mean? It's kind of, uh, but that's how we got. So how did we get the Inquisition? That was the first question. It's part of the slide. And if you're going to run everything and if you're going to dominate politically, you've got to have a mechanism. And they had the Inquisition to do that, to torture people that wouldn't go along with what they're saying. So. Secondly, church history can be a source not only of correcting misconceptions like where did, how did the church get into executing people, but heresies. And I just, I'm not going to take very long because we only have three minutes, but this is a textbook that we used at the Master's Seminary. It's called Heresies. It's written by a guy from Trinity uh, Seminary in Chicago. His name is Harold O.J. Brown. And his whole premise is that if you look at what the church was speaking against, the heresies and attacking them, you find the doctrinal teaching of the church. You know, the church didn't have time in the first three centuries and onward to really write systematic theology. What they did is they wrote apologies against heresies. And this is a beautiful book that explains through looking at the heresies that were combated, what the Orthodox Church believed. And that's the value of church history. It also can explain current issues. And I drew a little picture for you here. This is the Roman Catholic Church, the original uh, Catholic Church that got Romanized in the fourth century. Did you know that much of Catholic doctrine is uh, biblical? Much of it? Probably it's much bigger than this. In fact, it's probably about that much of Catholicism is very accurate. They're Trinitarian. They believe in the deity of Christ. They believe in the inspiration of scriptures. They've added to them, but they still believe, you know, in it. But what's dangerous is this part here 
is like rat poison. It's works religion. So they have mixed together truth plus deadly error. So this much of Catholicism is right out of God's word. The Reformation, very similar. It's much more truth, but they kept consubstantiation, they kept infant baptism, they kept anti-Semitism, uh, they kept a lot of stuff that they shouldn't have that are not in the Bible. And that's why uh, the, the, there are some really strange things coming out of some of these, like we talked about this morning in 1689, the, the whole you must keep the Old Testament Sabbath laws. Now we've got the modern day 1790, you know, uh, William Carey was, was part of this modern missions movement. And you know what? It's not all in the Bible. Some of their methodologies aren't biblical. Some of their traditions aren't biblical. Did you know that, that this is how the church started? This is how the church got reformed. This is how the church got, you know, in a modern form. This is the Billy Graham, Evan, Dwight L. Moody missions movement. Now we've got the current manifestation of the charismatics. This is, this is sweeping the world. You know what? Same thing. The vast majority of the charismatic church is very biblical. But you know what? There's the fringe out here that is way off. The Benny Hinn stuff and a lot of other stuff that I don't need to talk about. The, the barking Christians, the slain in the spirit Christians, the showmanship, the the greed, the pride, you know, the swagger, you know, Tammy Faye, all that stuff. But there's a lot, the majority of what they believe is biblical. Same here, same here, same here. But what we're supposed to adhere to is the scriptures. So you might wonder where we are. Well, Calvary right here, that's us, right? <laughs> Uh, no, you know what I mean. So, but you know what? It's time to go. And I'll just tell you this, that uh, church history can motivate and inspire. You know, some of my favorite biographies, C.T. Studd, Cricketer and Pioneer, Go Forth of China. You can read those and be inspired. Church history can help us see what God is doing. Whoop. Uh, here's another book, Ruth Tucker's book, Jerusalem to Irin Jaya. Uh, even our own Todd Aaron that came to our missions conference wrote this tremendous history to motivate us of what God can do. And finally, we're going to close with this. Church history can be very liberating, and I'm going to read this before we go, and we'll be two minutes late. But in Ephesians 4, we should always open the Bible. Look at Ephesians 4 if you have your Bible with me. And I want to close with this because this is a little dose of church history. It says in Ephesians 4 this, I beseech you, I'm in verse 1, uh, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling, verse 2, with all lowliness, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And look at verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You know what I wrote in my Bible? If you had in one room St. Augustine of the 4th century, Bernard of Clairvaux of the 11th century, Martin Luther and Calvin of the 16th century, Wesley and Whitfield of the 18th century, Moody and Hudson Taylor of the 19th century, and Billy Graham of the 20th century, you would never have a unanimous discussion on any doctrine except the ones that were most important. The one thing they all had in common is by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. And they sure had a lot of other stuff. And the blessing that's very liberating is that as long as you don't sacrifice the essentials, that you can be unified around the, the doctrine of Christ and salvation. 